Um, good evening and welcome to everyone. My name is Allison Powell and I'm an assistant professor here at the LSE. And I'm also the program director of the new MSc in Media and Communication, Data and Society. Tonight's event acts as the launch of this program and the related research activities that form part of what we refer to as LSE Data and Society. And you can see our hashtag, hashtag LSE Data Society um, on the screen behind me. Um, our research and teaching addresses significant social, cultural, and political implications of the turn towards data within contemporary societies and communications processes. This year, we're having discussions on um, topics including algorithmic accountability, the use of automation in news production, and the intersection between data collection and the experiences of traditionally marginalized communities. Our faculty study the ethics of data, civic data participation and technological citizenship, the roles of data intermediaries in creating value and meaning, and the social and cultural consequences of data platforms. Our students who are here tonight come from around the world, many returning to study after years of work, and bring to our program a wealth of experience from fields including resource management, journalism, and health. So I'm so delighted to launch the program and to welcome Professors Frank Pasquale and Evelyn Ruppert at our lunch tonight. And I want to welcome all of you to celebrate the beginning of this exciting teaching and research endeavor. So we'd like to invite you to a reception um, after this lecture as part of that launch. And also, I have to note as my official role as chair, in the unlikely event of a fire, the fire assembly point is across the road at the corner of Lincoln's Inn Fields Park. So, we are indeed fortunate to spend the evening with Frank and Evelyn. Um, Frank Pasquale is Professor of Law at the University of Maryland, and his research spans law and policy fields ranging from healthcare finance to privacy and intellectual property. Tonight, he'll be speaking on some of the key themes in his recent book, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information. Um, Frank is on the uh, advisory board of the Electronic Privacy Information Center and the Data Competition Institute and is an expert who gives testimony to many important national and international um, committees. Evelyn Rupert is professor of sociology at Goldsmiths, University of London. She's a principal investigator of a five-year European Research Council funded project called Peopling Europe, How Data Make a People. Evelyn is founding and editor-in-chief of a SAGE open access journal, Big Data and Society, and her book, Being Digital Citizens, written with Engen Eisen, was published in April of 2015. So we'll first hear from Frank with a response from Evelyn, and then I'll open the floor to questions from the audience and aim to finish at 8 o'clock. So I'd just like to turn over to Frank now, and thank you once again um, for joining us this evening. Well, thank you so much. And um, I really want to thank uh, Alison Powell and Nick Coldry, Sita Gangadharan, uh, for the invitation today, and all those who attended uh, yesterday's workshop on Black Box platforms. I already learned a great deal from those attendees, social scientists, computer scientists, others. And a special thank you to Evelyn Rupert for coming tonight to comment. Uh, I think Big Data and Society is a fantastic project uh, and is bringing together the community that I'm going to discuss tonight. So I'm first going to summarize my aims for this talk. And then I'm going to launch into uh, the, the, some examples. Okay? A community of social scientists, attorneys, lawyers, and computer scientists can both advance knowledge and promote justice by pursuing the goal of algorithmic accountability. Algorithms increasingly govern our social world. They are, in the most basic sense, step-by-step -step instructions for transforming a set of inputs, often data, into outputs, like scores or rankings. Hmm, maybe they're mysteriously controlling this. Um, <laughs> uh, law professor Edward Rubin has defined accountability as the ability of one actor to demand an explanation or justification of another actor for its actions and to reward or punish that second actor for those actions on the basis of its performance or explanation. And much of my book, uh, The Black Box Society, described how current processes of accountability often fail because the algorithms behind critical decision-making tools remain black boxed or the data does or some combination of those factors. 
But we should note, though, that this flow of ideas is two-way. Many high-tech firms believe that current methods of accountability are too indeterminate, soft, inclusive, or subject to delay or contestation. So those firms tend to sponsor academic and other work that would render accountability processes more algorithmic. They would efficientize them by essentially making them more computational or just more easy to understand and faster uh, by sort of bringing the algorithmic ideal to accountability processes. And I think sometimes that is a commendable reform strategy. However, sometimes the demand for algorithmic accountability in the second sense elides or excludes important human values, such as, and also necessary improvisations, and irreducibly deliberative governance procedures. And to paraphrase Nietzsche, he who fights with algorithmic decision makers should be careful lest he thereby become an algorithmic decision maker. If thou gaze long enough into the algorithms, the algorithms gaze into thee. So this talk will thus explore a classic issue in the philosophy of social science how our efforts to know the world change it and change ourselves. We will explore this problem through a number of case studies, and then I will recommend some goals for the community of scholars interested in algorithmic accountability. Our first glance at the problem will be through the eyes of an algorithmically ordered workforce. Stark and Rosenblatt's work on asymmetry and control in dynamic work examines algorithmic scores imposed by Uber on its drivers and what they mean for those drivers' everyday experience. So for example, you'd better have a score of 4.6 on UberX, or you'd have a better, better have a score of 4.7 on Uber Black or the SUV. You'd better have an acceptance rate of 90% or more, and you'd better have a cancellation rate of less than 5%. I call this Uber Capital in tribute to Forsad and Healy's use of that term in a recent article called Seeing Like the Market, that denote new forms of algorithmic reputation that are becoming a kind of credit or debt, right? If you get sort of a 4.9, maybe you feel like you got money in the bank and you can sort of slide a little bit. If you've got 4.5, you're in debt, right? And you've got to sort of work harder to get a higher score. Now, what does this mean for the average driver? Well, in a recent podcast series called InstaSurfs, a former Uber driver named Mansoor gave a chilling description of this new computer-mediated workplace. First, the company tried to persuade him to take a predatory loan to buy a new car. Apparently, a number cruncher deemed him at high risk of defaulting. Second, Uber would never respond in person to him. It just sent text messages and emails. This style of supervision was a series of take it or leave it ultimatums, a digital boss coded in advance. Then the company suddenly took a larger cut of revenues from him and other drivers, and you couldn't really understand why that happened. And finally, what seemed most outrageous to Mansoor, his job could be terminated without notice if as few passengers gave him one-star reviews, since that could drag his review below 4.7. According to him, Uber had no real recourse mechanisms or other due process in play for this rating system. It simply crunches the numbers. And I also wanted to show you a bit of the you know, phenomenology of the Uber experience. Um, these are two screenshots from Rosenblatt and Stark's work. And you can see that you know, the drivers are urged in real time, are you sure you want to go offline? You could make more money right now. Uh, then they're often sort of herded towards or told to go towards surge areas, like areas on a map that are in red. But if you see sort of toward the top of the screenshot, so one of the drivers in an online forum says, OK, you've been sitting in this surge for half an hour and not one ping. Okay? So this is difficult, right? Because the sort of overall system is not really rendered accountable. So the, the drivers, in some way, are rendered hyper accountable through constant surveillance, but the company itself often will evade explaining itself to them. And these stories compress long-standing trends in credit and employment. I'm not one of the people that says, oh, it's a whole new workforce and a whole new workplace. You know, of course, this has been reported on by labor reporters and labor scholars for years, the trends toward precarity and Taylorism, uh, et cetera, and sort of intensify in the digital environment. Um, and we also encounter in them, it's not just a, a matter of the workplace, right? There are several spheres of algorithmic authority, and in my book I propose a theory of levels of them, okay? And I, in, in thinking about these levels of algorithmic authority, so reputation firms that are ranking and rating individuals, search firms that might rank and rate the raters of individuals, finance firms that essentially operate on a second level of, of abstraction, we see what political scientist Ivan Asher calls a move from the hidden mode of production 
to a hidden mode of prediction as a way of understanding and categorizing individuals and workers. And I'll give some concrete examples of this. Online retailers live in fear of a Google death penalty. A sudden, mysterious drop in search engine rankings if they do something judged fraudulent by Google's spam detection algorithms. Job applicants at Walmart in the US and other large per companies take mysterious personality tests, which process their responses in undisclosed ways. And white collar workers face CV sorting software that may understate or entirely ignore their qualifications. One algorithmic CV analyzer described by Wharton professor John Capelli found all 29,000 people who applied for a reasonably standard engineering position unqualified. Okay. And I think we need to realize when we see some of these real effects of algorithms on individuals that the infancy of the internet is over. As online spaces mature, Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, and other powerful corporations are setting the rules that govern competition among journalists. Sorry about this. Um, writers, coders, and e-commerce firms. Uber and Postmates and other platforms are adding a code layer to occupations like driving and service work. Cyberspace can no longer be thought of as an escape from the real world. It is now a force governing it via algorithms, these recipe-like sets of instructions to solve problems. From Google search to OkCupid matchmaking, software orders and weights hundreds of variables into clean, simple interfaces, taking us from query to solution. Complex mathematics governs such answers, but it is hidden from plain view, thanks either to secrecy imposed by law or complexity that outsiders cannot unravel. Now, the focus tonight is going to be on this intertwining of reputation, how we're often seen by the world and categorized algorithmically, and search, how we use these algorithms or are mediating our views of the world of the online life via things like search engines, et cetera. And personalization means that how we attempt to make sense of the world increasingly shapes how others make sense of us. You see this really uh, clearly in, say, the Samsung Smart TV, where it's watching you as much as you're watching the TV, right? Um, these TVs are, are watching audiences to, for example, pick up on sentiment or are people in the room when the ads are on, et cetera. There's actually a patent out there for advertising uh, that is uh, built into a TV like this, which essentially lets someone, if so, let's say someone is sort of sitting down and watching television, the advertisement will say, jump up and say McDonald's like this, and then we'll end the ad, okay? So if you think about your online life and like dealing with YouTube where you have to click to get past the ad, they're now moving these sort of algorithmic assessments or computerized assessments of individuals' attentiveness to say it on uh, the real world or sort of our own experience of something like television. And I think that's a really interesting move and it leads to some slippages in say the uh, uh, understanding of the consequences of our actions. So one uh, interesting revelation earlier this uh, in 2013 is that Facebook is recycling likes to promote things that you've never seen to all your friends. So exa for example, you might have liked Walmart once. Say they may have done some, or uh, uh, this Frontola Restaurante or something like that. You may have liked something that they did, but then Facebook in terms of service can say we're going to attribute that like to you as liking further things from that page. And it can lead to some humorous results. So for example, one woman liked McDonald's once, maybe for the ice cream, um, but then she finds herself in her picture next to an ad for McNuggets. And she says, you know, this is offensive. I'm a vegetarian. I don't like McNuggets, right? <laughs> you know, and this is just, and this is from Christian Sandvig's article, Corrupt Personalization. It's just one small example, but I think it's an interesting example of how, you know, the old-fashioned unfair and deceptive acts and practices laws have a hard time catching up with this type of personalization. And we should have more of a public debate over to what extent should, say, liking one thing lead to an attribution that you like all things coming from that source or things like that. And, I, and this is just the beginning of big questions about data governance. These algorithms are increasingly important because businesses rarely thought of as high tech have learned the lessons of the internet giant's successes. Following the advice of Jeff Jarvis's What Would Google Do? And by the way, uh, that was a play on a Christian and evangelical text called What Would Jesus Do? So we've got what would, what would Jesus Do and then What Would Google Do for a business press? They're collecting data from both workers and customers using algorithmic tools to make decisions to sort the desirable from the disposable. Now, I've given you a really simple example and a really simple attribution, but these types of uh, information flows can be very complex. Okay, so what you're seeing up here is the flow of information that, say, could go 
from advertisers to publishers via things like agencies, media buying platforms, ad exchanges, ad networks, social uh, sites, etc. And one of the things that this type of uh, data processing and data exchange stresses is our idea of the possibility of individuals being able to keep track of all this, right? If the regulatory model is built on notice and consent of where your data is going, given current practices of online sharing, that makes things very, very difficult, okay? These entities that are involved in this process of brokering attention really lead to galaxies online of different permutations of data and inferences that can be drawn from it. Moreover, these methods are feeding into real interactions. So for example, when you call to complain about something, say at a large firm, say your airline or a rail company or uh, some other complaint to a, a firm that gives a cable television, those companies may be parsing your voice and your credit record simultaneously when you call them to determine whether you match up to ideal customer status or simply waste that can be treated with disdain, right? And you can think, if you've seen the movie Her, you can see you know, how an imagination of how sophisticated this type of algorithmic uh, voice recognition and voice translation can be in terms of reading people's emotions. And this goes even to the textual for our entertainment. So for one example, Epigogics is a firm that's advised movie studios on what scripts to buy based on how closely they match past successful scripts. I mean, that's one part of the algorithm, but there are many others that we don't know. And even winemakers make algorithmic judgments based on statistical analyses of weather and other characteristics of good and bad vintage years. I've even heard that sensors are so cheap now that each vine can have a sensor. Okay? Now, of course, for wines, the stakes are not terribly high. right? But when algorithms start affecting critical opportunities for employment, career advancement, health, credit, and education, I believe they deserve much more scrutiny. US hospitals are now using big data-driven systems to determine which patients are high risk and data far outside traditional health records is informing those determinations. For example, Natasha Singer has looked at hospitals that are using credit card data as one potential way of indicating whether someone is going to be adherent to their discharge regimen or will fail to take the medicines that they've been prescribed, and that marks them out for more interventions. Same thing, by the way, in college campuses. Many US college campuses, when the student comes in to see their professors, the students are given a rating of red, yellow, or green. And just to simplify the rating, it's, it's much better to be green than red. Okay? Um, and, and that even feeds into things like the, uh, uh, there's a dining hall at a Virginia University that has iris scan uh, technology that you, know, you could feed into this as well. And all of that is sort of built into, say, behavioristic models that could be you know, for some good purposes, but we can also imagine very troubling ends for each of these. For example, Oral Roberts University has recently required its students to all to wear Fitbits ostensibly to keep them healthy, but perhaps also to keep track of where they're going at night, right? And so I think that this, uh, this sort of thing, I think, is a, is a very troubling, uh, these can be very troubling, these, these new uses of data. And yet another example I'll give that I think really is important about the asymmetries here is that IBM now uses algorithmic assessment tools to sort employees worldwide on criteria of the employee's cost effectiveness. So you could be a programmer in White Plains, New York, and then one in London, and then one in Bangalore, and all are sort of being sorted along this one system. But note that it spares top managers the same invasive surveillance and ranking. And when one of the top managers was asked about this on a radio program, she said, well, there's just not that many of us. Big data wouldn't be that useful. I don't know, right? <laughs> and one of the themes I, I want to emphasize in this talk is that those who take on this uh, pervasive, invasive surveillance role really ought to be willing to critically examine their own role and their own ability to be judged by uh, similar systems. In government, too, algorithmic assessments of dangerousness can lead to longer sentences for convicts or no-fly lists for travelers. Moreover, it's not just the data that's important here. It's also inferences. And what we're seeing now is lists that are of individuals, you know, originally these lists might be of people who own cats or people who are dog lovers or people who really love fine wines. But, you know, it's now getting to the point where we have lists of people who are alcoholism sufferers, people who have AIDS or HIV, um, people who are agoraphobia sufferers. Um, there was one database that was uh, very uh, uh, in prominence a few years ago in the United States of a rape sufferers lists. There were lists of the home addresses of various uh, policemen and law enforcement officials. Um, this sort of runaway data is very troubling. You know? And by the way, they're getting these records, uh, and by the way, they're selling them when they say, 
uh, 38,009 total universe at $59 per thousand, essentially like 5.9 cents per name for this list of about 38,000 people with addiction or substance abuse, right? And one of the problems here is that this is being inferred, not necessarily, not probably from any sort of health data records, but from other, say, big data correlations that can be made to the conditions. Now, given the description I've, I've made in this first you know, 10 minutes or so of the talk, it may seem that we are fated to a permanent information asymmetry. Our own lives open books, like Philip Johnson's Glass House, while those firms which scrutinize us remain impregnable black boxes. Yet the development of such computerized sorting methods is anything but automatic. Search engines, for example, are paradigmatic examples of algorithmic technology, but their present look and feel owe a great deal to legal interventions. For example, thanks to Federal Trade Commission action in 2002, United States consumer protection laws require the separation of advertisements from unpaid slash organic content. In a world where media firms are constantly trying to blur the distinction between content and native advertising, that law matters. Now, is it perfectly enforced? No. If you look at the Search Engine Land blog or Marketing Land or the Trade Press, they're constantly complaining about ways that the search engine companies seem to be skirting around this type of required separation. But at least the law is there. And critically for our purposes, the fact that we have such law creates certain leverage that creates opportunities for social scientists, journalists, and researchers to understand what's going on. Okay? And this is going to be one of the main themes of the talk, that oftentimes it's this very symbiotic relationship between lawyers and social scientists, between social scientists and journalists, uh, all three directional way, all these ways working in different directions to maintain a flow of information about things that could remain black boxes if they, uh, that were not the case. I also believe that if you look at the EU antitrust uh, uh, competition law inquiry about Google, whatever your view may be as to the merits of the EU's action, you may believe that it is vital to a competitive playing field online, or you may believe that it is a protectionist measure aimed at keeping out U uh, US firms. Whatever you believe, you must admit, though, that we would know far less about the, these large institutions if we did not have these type of legal inquiries going on and if we did not have certain foundational legal commitments to competition, to fair competition online. These controversies have also, also given rise to a movement for algorithmic accountability. At Governing Algorithms, a 2013 conference at NYU, a community of scholars and activists coalesced to analyze the outputs of algorithmic processes critically. Like the access to knowledge mobilization did in the 2000s, we are turning a spotlight on key social just justice issues of the 2010s. Unfortunately, though, some in the business world would prefer to see the work of this community end before it has even started. Spokesmen and lobbyists for insurers, banks, and big business generally believe that key algorithms deserve the ironclad protections of trade secrecy so they can never be examined, let alone critiqued, by outsiders. But lawyers have faced down such stonewalling before, and I hope they will do so again. Regulators can make data-centric firms more accountable, but first they need to be aware of the many ways that business computation can go wrong. The data used may be inaccurate or inappropriate. Algorithmic modeling or analysis may be biased or incompetent. And the uses of algorithms are still opaque in many critical sectors. For example, we may not even know if our employers are judging us according to secret formula. In fact, however, at each stage of algorithmic decision making, simple legal reforms can bring basic protections, such as due process and anti-discrimination law, into a computational age. For example, everyone knows how inaccurate credit reports can be and how hard they can be to correct. But credit histories are actually one of the most regulated areas of the data economy, with lots of protection available for the savvy. Far more worrying, from my perspective, is the shady world of thousands of unregulated data brokers who create profiles of people built without their knowledge or their consent and often without the right to review or even correct them. One casual slur against you could enter into a random database without your knowledge and then go on to populate hundreds of other digital dossiers purporting to report on your health status, competence, or criminal record. This new digital underground can ruin reputations. One woman was falsely accused of being a meth dealer by a private data broker, and it took years for her to set the record straight, years during which landlords and banks denied her housing and credit. Government databases can be even worse. In the US, for example, tarring innocents with so-called suspicious activity reports, or SARs, 
And SARs have been issued for something as innocuous as taking a picture of a bridge. Okay? And, or they can harbor inaccurate arrest records. Both of these problems have beset unlucky citizens for years. And the data gluttony of both state and market actors means that ersatz reports can quickly spread. And what's really terrible about these databases is that the data sharing infrastructure is built such that it could so easily propagate from, say, one center, they're often called fusion centers in the US context, to 60 others, but they didn't build into the architecture the ability to bring that back and to delete it if the one center that did the report found out that was wrong. Now, I believe that this type of data infrastructure you know, is defective by design. Okay, we have to apply old tort law principles to things like this. If you develop a data infrastructure where you can slur people, and that just travels incredibly rapidly, but there's technical infrastructure available to bring back the slur when we find out it's incorrect, that's very troubling. Future reputation systems must enable the reversal of stigma as fast as they promote its spread. This is not an insoluble problem. Several laws govern the data gathering practices of credit bureaus. Extending and modernizing their protections would build accountability, mechanisms of fairness, and redress into systems currently slapped together with only quip profits, but not reputational integrity in mind. Data collection problems also go beyond inaccuracy. Some data methods are just too invasive to be permitted in a civilized society, perhaps even with people's consent. Even if applicants are so desperate for a job that they will allow themselves to be videotaped in the bathroom as a condition for employment, privacy law ought to stop those bargains. Digital data collection can also cross a line. For example, a former worker at an international wire transfer service claims that she was fired after she disabled an app that enabled the firm to track her location constantly. So imagine that, you know, the boss just says, I just want to know where you are all the time. Huh? Now, we should note that the employer might have business reasons beyond pure voyeurism or creepiness uh, for such tracking. It may find out that employees who are always home by 8 p.m. tend to perform better the next day at work. And in fact, um, I think there's this uh, book called The Wellness Syndrome that actually says that some hedge funds are experimenting with this. They have sort of biometric markers and ask their traders to report on what they eat and drink each day, and then they correlate what they eat and drink to their uh, returns at work uh, day by day. Uh, and then they, uh, purport, they hope that they can eventually sort of get them on the best optimal uh, return producing diet and exercise regimen. Um, <laughs> now, the, you know, the, the problem I think with these sort of systems, like this APM thing, is that they may then gradually introduce incentives for or even require behavior among its entire workforce. And however much knowledge of every moment of a worker's life may add to the bottom line, a democratic society should resist it. There needs to be some basic division, I believe, between work and non-work life. Now, limits on data collection will frustrate some big data mavens. I mean, there was a talk at the Berkman Center a few years ago that was entitled N equals billions, how the smartphone revolution will upend traditional social science and bring us truth, or something like that, you know? And I think that, and, and there's many people that really believe in this, this vision. Um, for example, the CEO of Zest Finance proudly stated that all data is credit data. That is, the predictive analytics can take virtually any scrap of information about a person, analyze whether it corresponds to a characteristic of known to be creditworthy people, and extrapolate accordingly. And uh, you know, this uh, information could be, it, it works in several directions. It's multidimensional, right? So they might find, for example, that your driving record helps predict your credit score, or your credit score helps predict your driving record. And this leads to whole new questions about what Paul Ohm and Scott Pettit, Pepit call the discriminatory inferences project of modern big data analysis. Um, they're very concerned about ways this could be misused. Because data like this could even include things like sexual orientation or political views. But even if we knew that supporters of, uh, say, the conservatives or were more likely to be behind on their bills than, say, supporters of the Greens, is that really something that we trust our banks or credit scores to know or want them to know? Is it knowledge that they should have? Marriage counseling, for example, may be treated as a signal of impending instability in a relationship. And that could lead to higher interest rates or lower credit limits, right? From a purely actuarial perspective, oh boy, they're getting counseling. Maybe they're going to be breaking up and have to get two houses, et cetera. You know, and that has actually led, then used, it's been documented in use by one uh, credit card company, that they would use that as a trigger to raise the credit, uh, to raise the interest rate and lower the, uh, the, the uh, credit limit. 
Um, however, fortunately, that firm has settled a lawsuit for doing that, even though they did, they did not admit wrongdoing in it. But I would go further, and I would say it should not just be a matter of, you know, they got in trouble for not telling people about this being uh, part of the process. But we've got to get beyond the sort of transparency mantra and say certain things they shouldn't, just shouldn't be doing. Such intimate information shouldn't be monetized. Too many big data mavens aspire to analyze all capturable information, but when their fever dreams of a perfectly known world clash with basic values, they must yield. While most privacy activists focus on the collection issue, the threat posed by reckless, bad, or discriminatory analysis may well be more potent. Consider a likely employment success score that heavily weights an applicant's race, zip code, or present employment. Each of these pieces of data may be innocent or appropriate. For example, there's a firm called Antello that tries to match minority applicants to firms that want more diversity, which is a big problem in Silicon Valley and some other tech hubs. But they should also bear scrutiny. Consider racism first. There's a long and troubling history of discrimination. And extant employment discrimination laws can ban bias and result in heavy penalties. But the problem is that these algorithmic decision-making processes can get around them through what is often called big data proxies. Society abounds with data that are often simple proxies for discrimination, say zip or postal codes, if you know, say, the exact uh, racial composition of the areas, or can end up with the same effect. Consider also a variable that seems on its face less charged months since last job. Such data could aid employers who favor workers quickly moving from job to job, or it could discriminate against those who need time off to recover from an illness. Worried about the potentially unfair impact of such considerations, some jurisdictions have forbidden employers from posting help wanted signs that tell the unemployed, you need not apply. I know that seems kind of strange, but the basic idea of this is that they want people who are sort of jumping from job to job. They don't want someone who's unemployed or someone who's unemployed for more than three, four, or five months. Now, I believe that these uh, laws are commendable, but whatever their merits, what teeth will these laws have if employers never see CVs excluded by an algorithm that blackballs those whose latest entry for work is more than a few months old, right? It's not like firms are, once the law is out there, it's not like firms are going to say, oh yeah, we like violating this law. They can just encode the legal violation into an algorithm that's very difficult for uh, regulators to inspect, as we saw in the Volkswagen example, right? Big data can easily turn into a sophisticated tool for deepening already prevalent forms of unfair disadvantage and regulatory arbitrage. Law enforcers of the future could find it difficult to learn all the variables that go into credit and employment decisions. Protected by trade secrecy, many algorithms remain impenetrable to outside observers. When they try to unveil them, litigants can face a catch-22. Legitimately concerned to stop phishing expeditions, courts are likely to grant discovery requests only if a plaintiff has accumulated some quantity of evidence of discrimination. But if the key entity making a decision was a faceless, black-boxed algorithm, what's the basis for the initial suspicion? And of course, some regulators have often encouraged businesses to use algorithms to make decisions. Regulators want to avoid the irrational or subconscious biases of human decision makers. But of course, human decision makers devised the algorithms. They gathered and cleaned the data, as Lily Arani's excellent work uh, on so-called data janitors shows, and they influenced its analysis. No code layer can create a plug-and-play level playing field. Policy, human judgment, and law will always be needed. When an important decision maker decides to use an algorithmic ranking and rating, he or she owes it to the people ranked and rated to explain exactly what data was used, how it was analyzed, and how potential mistakes, biases, or violations of law can be identified, corrected, or challenged. In areas ranging from banking and employment to housing and insurance, algorithms may well be kingmakers, deciding who gets hired or fired, who gets erased, or who is demoted. People need to be understand how they work or don't work. The growing industry of predictive analytics will object to this proposal, claiming that its, its ways of ranking and rating persons deserve absolute protection. Such intellectual property is well protected under current law, but the government can condition funding on the use or disclosure of the data and methods used by its contractors. And let's face it, modern governments and industrial societies have a lot of contractors. The government's power to use its leverage as purchaser is enormous. And it could deny contracts to companies that, say, use secret algorithms to make employment decisions or based credit decisions on objectionable data. Public spending should also reward the creation of accountable algorithmic decision making in other ways, rather than simply paying for whatever tools its contractors come up with. 
We would not tolerate parks studded by listening equipment that recorded every stroller's conversation or refused entry to the bathrooms to those designated vandalism risk by secret software. We should have similar expectations of privacy and fair treatment in the thousands of algorithmic systems government directly or indirectly funds each year. Now, I want to give one other example here that I think just gives a sense of how uh, unexpected these correlations might be. Um, some clinical trial recruiters have discovered that people who own minivans have no young children and subscribe to many cable TV channels are more likely to be obese. <laughs> At least in their databases and perhaps in others, these minivan driving childless cable lovers are suddenly transmuted into a new group, the likely are obese. And that inference is, is a new piece of data created about them. Now, an inference like this may not be worth much on its own, and I would also question all of these just-so stories offered about TV habits, pet ownership, web shopping, et cetera. Had it come out the reverse way, I could give you a story about why, um, you know, ha why being, having a minivan actually shows uh, uh, that you're a sporty person who always needs to carry around your sports equipment or something like that, right? <laughs> we, we can all play this game, right? And, and that's what we have to really worry about when we hear some social scientists say, well, we're using the big data to generate uh, hypotheses. Right? Because there are so many ways in which you can, you can explain them. And I think that this is, uh, in these inferences, you know, once these people are so identified, it could easily be combined and recombined with other lists, say of plus size shoppers, that's a list, or frequent buyers of fast food that solidify the inference. A new algorithm from Facebook instantly classifies individuals and photographs based on body type or posture. The holy grail of algorithmic reputation is the most complete possible database of each individual unifying credit, telecom, location, retail, and other dozens of data streams into a digital doppelganger of each of us. And we should consider there's a lot of concern now, and in my book, on the consumer side of this, being modeled as a digital doppelganger as a consumer. But the automation debates we're having presently are about the same thing, right? The same thing that bosses are trying to do with workers when they try to robotize or softwareize their work is to keep track of everything the worker does and then just transmute it into software and say, sorry, a robot's doing your job in the future. So the stakes of the data could not be higher on our roles as either workers or consumers. Now, however certain they may be about our height or weight or health status, though, it suits the data gatherers to keep these classifications murky. And here I'm going to get into a little bit of legal trickery. A person could, in principle, launch a defamation lawsuit against a data broker that falsely asserted the individual concern was diabetic. But if the broker instead chooses a fuzzier classification, such as member of a diabetic concerned household, it looks a lot more like an opinion than a fact to courts. Opinions are much harder to prove defamatory. How might you demonstrate beyond a doubt that your household is not in some way diabetic concerned? But the softer classification may lead to exactly the same disadvantageous outcomes as the harder, more factual ones. Similar arbitrage strategies may attract other businesses. For instance, if an employer tells you he is not hiring you because you're diabetic, that, at least in the US, would be clearly illegal under disability law. But what if there is some euphemistic terminology that scores your robustness as an employee? Even if the score is based in part on health-related information, that may be near impossible to prove because candidates almost never know what goes into an employer's decision not to interview them or give them a job. An employer may even claim not to know what's going into the score, right? They may say, we just contracted out to somebody else, and then they have the secret score. And that's a lot of what my, my book talks about in the finance chapter, is about various entities on Wall Street just saying, well, we haven't really looked that deeply into the securities, but don't worry, our credit rating agencies have, right? And this practice, I believe, of sort of algorithmically outsourcing is very troubling, too. When so much anti-discrimination law requires plaintiffs, say, in the employment context, to prove an intent to use forbidden classifications, Ignorance may be bliss, and it can be bliss in fraud prosecutions as well. It will be much easier to regulate these troubling possibilities before they become widespread endemic business practices. One hopeful sign, I think, is that the EEOC in the United States is considering disputes stemming from employer personality tests, featuring questions that seem to be looking for patterns of thought connected to mental illnesses, but unrelated to bona fide occupational qualifications or performance. Those investigations, I believe, should continue and extend to a growing class of algorithmic assessments of past or likely performance. In some cases, mere disclosure and analysis of algorithmic assessments is not enough to make them fair. Rather, their use may need to be forbidden in certain important contexts. 
And now I'm going to relatively quickly go through three contexts where I am concerned here. Okay? So one of them comes in this context of credit scores and history. So just to give an introduction to this concept, <coughs> it'll become important in some of the later slides. A good score could be, say, above 700. A bad score could be, say, six uh, or 500 or so, 580. And the history of credit scoring is essentially a history of the credit scores moving, or the credit bureaus moving from providing histories of individuals to just snapshots of scores of, their, of what, what their credit history is. Um, and this, on some level, made finance much faster, right? You can just go into a bank, show your score, and get some sort of credit there. But what I want us to really pay attention to, though, is that these systems gain legitimacy via a rhetoric of moralization that can be entirely misleading, OK? So these are screenshots of, from a commercial uh, by creditreport.com that is from one of the entities that actually produces credit scores, sells them, validates them, et cetera. And the commercial began with um, poor Stan saying, my credit score is 560, so uh, creditors think that I'm lazy. But I went to creditreport.com and tried to clean up some of my credit report, and now they just know me as Stan, not as lazy man. You know, okay? So this was their pre his presentation. And the, you, essentially, these firms that are selling the scores are using that money to buy these ads to tell society in general how good and important the scores are. Well. What ended up being revealed about this particular initiative is, first of all, creditreport.com is owned by Experian, and the score it sells you is Experian's plus score, not the one used by lenders. Okay? Moreover, it charges you a dollar for this credit report, which you could get for free at annualcreditreport.com, a governmentally uh, sponsored site. And then the fine print says that after a seven-day trial, you'll be charged $19.95 a month. So what you see here is some people who say might have credit problems they're drawn into this logic of trying to uh, make a better name for themselves, but you know, having that extra hit of 19.95 a month is really going to hurt them. Okay, and it's probably not going to show up in the algorithm that say they were trying to help themselves, but then they fell behind in part because they had this extra bill. Now, some people say, and this is getting into back into our main theme of algorithmic accountability, that the way you solve that is you bring in more data. Okay, so they say instead of forcing poor Stan here to go to um, uh, Experian or to creditsreport.com and try to do more to, to fix his credit data that's based on this baseline data of credit account information and financial judgments, what we should do is we should bring in more data, like say his utility payments, or have a 360 degree view of them. Look at what Stan says on social media. Look at his location data. Look at his shopping habits and government records. There are so many new startups that are doing exactly this, to bringing in this fringe data. And by 2009, even mainline financiers were scrutinizing their own data. So for example, um, if you bought little felt pads that stopped the chair legs from scratching the floor, like if this had a pad down here, um, <laughs> if you bought these pads, you could be rewarded with a higher credit line or lower insurance because that was correlated with being a more responsible individual. But <laughs> if you purchased a beer at a, sh at a shady bar, then you could have a lower line. Okay? And so this is really interesting, this is sort of press uh, for all of these different forms of uh, data. And it's leading to tons of other innovations for, that sort of bring in both privacy and uh, intellectual property law. So for example, Facebook now has a patent uh, essentially on calculating credit worthiness based on attributes of your friends. So it's relatively simple to imagine a world, and this is a cartoon by Susie Cagle, uh, where she describes, uh, or she sort of envisions a future Facebook where people's scores just are right up there on their profile, and then someone is told, you know, you've got to cut some of the dead weight man if you want to get a, get a loan, okay? And has sort of a rather heart-rending exchange, you know, by the guy talking to his uh, friends who are, some have lower credit scores, some do not. And of course, that may seem really uh, uh, terrifying or just science fictional, but there's a new credit scoring system that's been sort of put forward in China's uh, planning outline for the construction of a social credit system that has raised a lot of buzz in the media. And now admittedly, you know, the stories about this social credit scoring system are, have not, there are some conflicting reports on it. But the bottom line that I've been able to draw from many of these stories is first of all, that individuals can get their score and instantly show it to their friends that they can rank themselves among their friends for certain attributes of frugality, timeliness, et cetera, 
And that it is possible in the future that things like uh, going to a protest uh, could feed into someone's score. So if you're on a certain governmental list of, say, undesirables or suspicious individuals, that could feed into the score as well. And you see in this type of scoring system, it's very troubling because I think that this is you know, a possibility of you don't have to have force to get people in line. You just have to have them commit themselves strongly enough to a certain way of ranking and rating and understanding one another. And this is even going further. I mean, this Sesame Credit is conducting a test program with a Chinese online dating site that would allow suitors to check their potential dates' credit ratings to make sure they are not meeting someone who is dishonest or untrustworthy. And there's also recent American research that's found that the higher your credit score, the higher your chances of a lasting relationship. But the problem, again, in so much of this uh, effort to make algorithmic scoring and ranking is there isn't enough critical thought about causation or self-fulfilling prophecies or other aspects of these findings. Um, and I think that's really troubling. And you can imagine even further, you know, a little bit further in the future, a service like this could be integrated into a new iteration of Google Glass replacing 20th century beer goggles with the pristine clarity of credit score microscopes. So my concern here is that I really believe that we're going to see in response to, say, the unfairness in Stan's case or concerns about old, old line credit scoring, two different approaches. We're going to see some saying, let's make accountability more algorithmic by, say, adding in more data and, say, having more user consent procedures, but overall keeping the same thing going. But I believe that, you know, at least in, many, in some of the situations that I've brought up tonight, we should have a serious public discussion about requiring either public scoring methods, so we all understand the score, or stopping certain scoring methods that can be deeply troubling or disciplinary, or requiring case-by-case -case disputes over the scoring or interpretation of data. I think any of those approaches should be part of our repertoire of responses to this new algorithmic reality. Now, very quickly, oh, and, and I also, I'll be posting this later. Um, this is just sort of a, the credit scoring, as you can see in the upper uh, middle corner, is just part of a number of projects I've been working on, looking at these scores in the law enforcement, finance, and medical context, focusing in particular on either inaccurate and appropriate data, biased or improper modeling, and opaque or inappropriate uses of algorithms. And through these you know, eight or so projects, I've tried to paint a picture of essentially very deeply troubling non-accountability systems in each of those zones. Now, moving on a little bit further, let's talk a bit about the right to be forgotten. And European Union regulators here are trying to ensure that irrelevant, outdated, or prejudicial material does not haunt individuals' name search results. And I believe this is a really critical task in an era when so many prospective employers Google those whom they are considering for a job. The EU has also spurred search engines to take human dignity into account by, for example, approving the request of a victim of physical assault who asked for results describing the assault to be removed from queries against her name. Now, of course, there's a lot of pushback against the right to be forgotten, right? You hear some concerns that, say, public figures are going to erase discreditable things about them. But if you look at this initial list compiled by Julia Powells of the left-hand side is those who uh, had delisted results, the right-hand side is rejections, at least from this initial sample, I think that there's a lot creditable to be found here, right? There are a lot of, there's a lot of attention to, say, victims or people's medical history gets online. And there is uh, not so much uh, protection or no protection at all for public figures or those who've done grave crimes. And what I believe this shows is that internet firms can be held legally responsible to prevent, say, high-profile publicity re republication of, say, breached psychiatric records. I think we're going to see several situations in the future where there's going to be data breaches, particularly of very sensitive information. It's going to get republished. And we have to be able to have a reality where the entities that are organizing and ordering our online reputation have some responsibility for not permanently dominating our reputation with, say, one particular information, piece of information that may not even be true, or if true, for example, in the case of medical records, may be inappropriate or problematic uh, to be so, high, so salient. Now, I want to give one final example, though, according to the theme of the talk on this theme of algorithmic accountability. One issue here is you might notice on the right-hand column that many people who are rejected in their efforts are, say, politicians or media professionals or those who have already a very high profile. Now, this question of the public figure leads to the, the great controversy over who is a public figure, right? 
who gets to take full protection of this, uh, uh, takes the full protection of the right to be forgotten, and who's just going to be treated as a public figure? Well, we could, say, use something like clout scores to determine this. And you can see, you know, I give two clout scores here. This is an algorithmic uh, uh, entity that tries to rate people's social media presence. Um, the highest score is held by Barack Obama right now. Um, but watch out, I think Justin Bieber can overtake him by 2018. Uh, <laughs> you know, and again, this is one of these secretly black boss sort of prof uh, uh, algorithmic profiles. And, you know, you could see in the uh, ongoing determinations of the Article 29 Working Party and the GDPR and others who work in this area, an effort to, say, have quantitative measures of, say, once you have 20,000 Twitter followers, you're a public figure. But I think we really should continue a sort of case-by-case -case process of deliberation on the totality of interests involved. And I know that's going to frustrate a lot of people in the tech world, but I believe it's really essential in order to make sure that human values can be recognized. Now, very quickly, I want to go through one last example, which is corporate experimentation. You may have heard about the uh, Facebook controversy, the issue that essentially Facebook was doing something called an emotional manipulation experiment. Um, they had 600,000 users. Some they showed uh, more negative data to. Some they showed more positive data to. Then they found out that uh, increased, say, their measured affect by the number of positive or negative words that they used. Um, there was a lot of concern about this. You know, and, a lot of and Facebook itself was relatively contrite and changed some of its procedures. However, there were firms that were not contrite, including OkCupid. So OkCupid, uh, its uh, leader, uh, Christian Rudder, pictured here, he said, you know, look, we experiment all the time on human beings, and so we're not really apologetic about it. That's A-B testing. And he talked about one experiment they did, which was they told people who were actually good for each other by their matching algorithms that they were bad, and they told people who were bad for each other that they were good. Okay? And I can, I, you can expect sort of some of the statistics here of how those matches ultimately turned out. Now, a lot of people, I think, would say, say within the Silicon Valley community, they might say, well, that's A-B testing. That's just, you know, one more experiment we want to do. But I think we should really hesitate before we enter into a world in which that becomes de rigueur. Okay? And the reason why I think that is because there are extant legal protections for things like human subjects research in a university context, and at least in my state, in the uh, general research context, where people are supposed to have informed consent. And this is a letter from uh, two of my colleagues. It's available online, James Groman and Leslie Henry who complained to the Attorney General of Maryland about exactly this issue, about essentially trying to get some form of informed consent from users. And one other thing I would say is that even if you don't like the informed consent model for this type of experimentation, we should at least think about, wow, what if the company knew that certain people had certain psychological profiles where they could be unduly hurt by exposure to certain types of, uh, of stimuli? Should they take that into account? Are there other forms of responsibility that could be taken into account? I think that's critical. Now, Facebook responding said, you know, no, we really don't think there's a problem here. And my colleagues are still rating on sort of uh, legal responses uh, within the state. But I do think that this is a really critical issue in the future of corporate experimentation. And we have to think more deeply about it. Another issue we have to think about is governance. So for example, recently, uh, Tinder's desirability algorithm came into the news. And there was a great interview with the CEO of Tinder where they talked about all the factors that could come into how someone could be ranked uh, desirable or not. But commentators said, you know, a lot of firms, especially yours, appear to be pretty male-dominated. Are there many uh, women's voices about this desirability algorithm? And I, I'm waiting to hear back. Um, but but this, this seems to be an issue in an area where you would want to have some baseline level of, uh, you know, sort of representation. And I think the governance here is key. I also want to leave you with uh, an idea about the importance of critical theory and the importance of artistic responses to these types of uh, dilemmas that we're seeing. Okay. So for example, um, on the left here, you see a, an artwork, actually, that is a, uh, essentially models, it's called Tender, uh, and it uh, has a picture of the Tinder screen. And the, the artists here, have essentially presented the model user of the app as one continually engaged with it, continually swiping right. Okay? But their presentation of the swiper as a piece of inert meat, that should alert us to beware of easy importation of natural science methods into human affairs. Right? There are places where we as human beings expect to be modeled as or treated differently than the natural world. 
And I think we see this concern also in Bernard Harcourt's book, Exposed, where he has a theory of surveillance. I think it's a wonderful theory of surveillance as a sh shaping or conditioning mechanism. And that brings up yet again these problems of self-fulfilling prophecies and algorithmic methods that create rather than respond to util uh, the users and to reality. And what I believe is really critical here is, again, it's not just a question of making accountability more algorithmic, of just adding new consent procedures, or talking about the breadth of consent, broad consent, narrow consent, et cetera. It really is about having some level of independent advising or control or governance and bringing some diversity of voices into that. I think that that is critical to the future of algorithmic accountability. Now, I'll close with just a, 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 a blurb or a pitch from my own conference that's coming up on this, <laughs> this idea, which is that uh, in April, we're going to be doing at Yale Law School a conference called Unlocking the Black Box, The Promise and Limits of Algorithmic Accountability in the Professions. And our idea is essentially that many professions, law, medicine, journalism, that one of the main goals of these professions is going to be generating, maintaining, monitoring algorithmic accountability in these various fields. Um, now, of course, the opposite view is also out there. I think if you look at, say, the Susskind's recent book on the future of the professions, they would say essentially, you know, we need to render the professions themselves are not accountable enough and can only be made so by being made more algorithmic. What we're trying to do at this conference is to explore the other side, to see if we're a role for professions. And I believe that researchers now, and this is uh, also from the Algorithms Account and Accountability Conference that was at NYU back in 2015. There was also another one in 2013. Wonderful resources from there available online. I believe that this really shows, this academic community at all of these conferences show that we have to go beyond big firms' game of musical expertise. A lot of the uh, lawyers of these firms, um, they say to activist lawyers, hey, you guys don't understand the code. But when coders object, they are told, you don't understand the law. And then economists and sociologists and ethicists hear variations on both of these stonewalling stances. In truth, for all of the examples I've given tonight, it took a combination of computational, legal, and social scientific skills to unearth each of these examples. Collaboration among experts in different fields is likely to yield even more important work. We hope to see journalists teaming up with computer programmers and, say, lawyers with FOIA requests to expose new privacy-violating technologies of data collection and to push regulators to crack down on the worst offenders. The world is full of these algorithmically driven decisions. One errant or discriminatory piece of information can wreck someone's employment or credit prospects. So it is vital that citizens be empowered to see and regulate the digital dossiers of business giants and government agencies. And even if one believes that no information should be deleted, that every slip and mistake anyone made should be on a permanent record forever, that still leaves important decisions to be made about the processing of data, its sharing, its use. Algorithms can be made more accountable, respecting rights of fairness and dignity. The challenge is not only or even mainly technical, but political and social. Law can empower researchers to understand these firms rather than simply serving them. Researchers and journalists can alert lawyers to novel problems meriting innovative regulatory responses. Computer scientists can test the technical feasibility of proposed accountability mechanisms. Working together, we can find a proper balance between efforts to make accountability processes more efficient and algorithmic and initiatives to either cabin algorithmic decision making or complement it with more deliberative, improvisational, or juridical processes. Striking this balance will be critical to the maintenance of the rule of law and democracy, rather than what John Danaher calls algocracy in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for that, uh, that wonderful uh, talk, and it's a really a great pleasure to provide some initial responses uh, to um, some of the points you made, and I think take them in a little bit of a different direction, but elaborate perhaps on, on some of the ideas, et cetera, and especially in relation to how I, I first came across Frank's work was through the journal, and it was through people writing about it. 
So, I mean, well cited, for sure, in terms of people being, taking it up and, and working with it, et cetera. So this has really been influential work, and there's a lot in the journal that you can read about in terms of uh, these debates. But I think you've really well exemplified um, in your book, especially, and, and here today, about how um, algorithms are not simply technical recipes, but they are importantly part of a longer political genealogy of classification, sorting, categorizing of people that continues to involve and always has involved moral assumptions, prejudices, discriminatory judgments, political interests, and struggles. And I think it's really great that you draw a lot of attention, especially to the protection of secrecy, which a lot of especially corporate actors hide behind in terms of the uses they make of algorithms, and how relatively we have a lot of silence about the privacy of, of individuals and their rights. So I think it's really important that we also attend to things like algorithms to get away from some of the hype, especially about big data, that the problem is about data and its volume. But here we put the importance onto the um, analytics and what is done with data as being really critical and, and creating these pernicious effects. And I think you've given a good uh, um, set of examples and case studies, which is really wonderful and that's what law does so well. We got good case studies from law showing and exemplifying you know, the kinds of uses that, that he's talking about. And I also really appreciate um, you saying we don't have to just throw our hands up, that we have good regulatory precedents and we can build on those precedents um, to address issues of fairness and address redress um, into our data systems. And I think that, that is really important. And I think you've also been, um, along with other people in the US, really creating a, a lot of attention to these issues, including the Council for Big Data Ethics and Society I know that you're a part of, and the conference you've just mentioned and all of that. Um, there's lots of other initiatives going on, but what I'm going to do is pick up, pick up on a few lines of thought that I think might be useful for us to also um, hear about how some of your work's been taken up and the lively kind of discussion and debate that's happening and critique also about algorithmic accountability in its various forms. Because this is kind of a thing in the making and it's a great moment to really also be critical and hear different voices about the promises and pitfalls of, of this. Certainly there's no dearth of talk about algorithms. We've got meetings, events, I've got so many journal articles now um, and projects, I can't keep up with them. And uh, it was very interesting recently at an event on algorithms, which I organized and I'm part of all this talk about algorithms, where Adrian McKenzie of Lancaster University um, offered that the attention on algorithms today perhaps has replaced discourse or language, which in the 1980s was the governmental thing that we ought to be worried about. And perhaps now our post-structuralist studies of power and knowledge are moving away from discourse and now moving to the algorithm as that organizing principle of, of governing ourselves and others. Especially um, inspired by Foucault, um, for those who um, study discourse, we look at how it forms what is sayable, what's knowable, what's powerful, powerful and how we're governed, how that um, makes up the problematizations, the rationalities, the logics and the solutions that come to shape our lives. So whether it's rationalities and judgments that underpin classifications, um, and put people into categories or how the design of urban spaces are thought. Power is basically, in, in that um, understanding, you know, bound up with what is said and known and done. And so we were asking our algorithms, the new discourses that are doing this work, that are sorting and organizing lives. Are the designers of algorithms now the dominant actors who are forming what is knowable and powerful? But just as critics have argued that a focus on discourse itself was and is too narrow, I think the same can be said about algorithms, that they don't account for the complex workings, the distributed practices, the ambiguities, the misfires, the dynamics of the implementation of governing practices. Now, to be sure, we can find that kind of critique in a number of uh, um, articles published recently, especially about the uh, presumed agential capacities of algorithms and even about their presumed opacity. Um, there's a recently published uh, special issue of the journal Science, Technology, and Human Values edited by Malta Zewitz, which brings some of that critical voice into it. I think it's in response to these kinds of questions that I'll outline just two worries and perhaps uh, one proposition. And the first is whether we give too much power over to the algorithm. And second, what are the pitfalls of thinking that transparency and accountability are the targets? 
And the proposition then I'll put forward is to bring attention to accountability, accountability perhaps for the performative effects of computational systems of which algorithms are just one part, and also to bring the citizen subject of data rights into the center of analysis and our possible solutions. So I'll, I'll talk about the worries and then I'll, I'll put my uh, proposition more um, firmly on the table. As uh, Frank has noted, um, algorithms are often called recipes. They're logical rules or statements. They're formalized descriptions um, about how people should be sorted or information could be sorted. I thought it was very interesting at a, another event, um, this time a lecture at, at Goldsmiths, where informatics scholar Paul Durish from uh, UC Irvine reminded us of the distinction others have made between this definition of algorithms and that of code. And he noted that we really ought to be careful about how these get conflated, and we ought to make sure we differentiate the two, because it really matters. He argued that algorithms can best be described as pseudocode, and a lot of people have used that to capture what they usually are, which is high-level descriptions that are formulated often in abstract language. They're sketches, they exist on paper, they're on blackboards, they're in talk, and they generally describe relations, whereas code, he argued, is the opera opera operationalization, that's a hard word, of an algorithm, and can be done in many different ways, using different programming languages, and these things matter. So there's not a direct translation from an algorithm in this sort of pseudocode to, to code and um, its programming. And he argues that sometimes pseudocode's not implemented in the ways it was intended, that uh, we don't also, when we look at programs and code, we can't recognize even the location of the algorithm, which is often parsed and split and without or throughout a, a program itself. So it's hard to even find where the algorithm is within a program. Basically, what he drew our attention to, which is uh, important, is that there's no algorithm that hasn't been translated into code. And algorithms are nothing without that code and without programming languages. And he even went further than that to remind us also, algorithms and code and programming depend on overall system architectures, on data structures. They're all made up also of particular logics of representation, et cetera. And in light of this, he suggested that perhaps many of our critiques are really about concerns of this more broader computational environment and the digital control and management of data, and that algorithms are but one small you know, part of it, of this larger complex of computational control. So we need to think about how those relations happen and what, how they matter. And I think there are a couple of reasons this is um, important for us for our conversation tonight. The first is that we ought to see our or ask our algorithms the right target. And the second draws from an article recently published in Big Data and Society by Jenna Burrell, a professor in the School of Information at Berkeley. Um, basically, she complicates the issue of transparency and accountability by distinguishing between different types of algorithms. Now, I know Frank has really focused on one set um, the really uh, a kind of trade secret kind, especially of corporations, but also of governments. But she argues that that's just one kind of algorithm in the world that we need to really be thinking about. So it's the one of uh, the corporations, as I said, or even maybe of major platforms such as Google and Twitter and Facebook and the particular algorithms operating in there. But the second source of opacity or, or the, of lack of transparency is the difficulty of understanding code itself or being able to actually audit code even if one is an expert because of the opacity of it and for the reasons I mentioned earlier about how it gets buried within programs. But there's a third kind that she really um, focuses on and which is perhaps, well not perhaps, it is the one that's related especially to big data and that's the kind of big data algorithms that are based on machine learning and that work on large data sets to identify patterns that are statistical and probabilistic. So instead of starting with categories and then finding data that match, machine learning identifies data and uh, or patterns in data, and then that has to be interpreted for meaning. For some, this is called data-driven categorization. Now, the code of these machine learning algorithms, she argues, are not auditable because they are at a scale and at a complexity that go beyond just reading and comprehending code, but are more about being able to understand how the algorithm happens in action and how it operates on data and changes and at scales beyond human capacities. And one source of this is that the internal decision logic of the algorithm is altered as it learns on training data. 
So we have radical instability here, and it's more profound than that of the other algorithms, and introduces a different kind of opacity. So when she writes, she says, when a computer learns and consequently builds its own representation of a classification decision, it does so without regard for human comprehension. Machine optimizations based on training data do not naturally accord with human, human semantic explanations. In other words, the results of machine learning needs humans to interpret and say what these signal and mean uh, in terms of categories of people. The algorithm only identifies the commonalities in millions of pieces of training data, but does not express or interpret this in meaningful ways or meaningful ways to humans. But of course, as Frank has rightly pointed out, humans are really part of every step along the way when we think about algorithms. Human decision makers devise that pseudocode, they inflect the data, they influence its analysis, human judgment is there all the way. But indeed, we have a language today that actually gets rid of or loses that human involvement. And naturalized terms such as machine learning or artificial intelligence or internet of things um, or robotics, et cetera. And it's amazing how through such language we have come to really close down our imaginaries of how humans are involved, such that we're perhaps not even post-human but beyond human. Now this is both what uh, uh, Durish and Burl point out, that num numerous humans are indeed part of a complex tangle of decisions and infrastructures and technologies and control of data that's classifying also people. And surely if we look at um, decades now of uh, social science research, which I'm most familiar with, especially of that of science and technology studies, we've learned that uh, you know, this is what um, systems work on. They work on very long, tangled relations and decisions amongst people and things. And if we look at lots of ethnographic studies of this um, that study algorithms and actions, such as a recent article by one of my colleagues at Goldsmiths, Dan Nayland, we see these complex orderings and numerous sense-making activities and human decisions that are involved in algorithms and action. So my question then is, well, where do we go from here? And I'd like to offer first a different concern about openness, um, which, like algorithms, is a big, major focus of attention today. We've got open government, open data, open source. Um, open now is the answer not only to accountability, but various problems of democracy. Indeed, it was the value that underpinned these sort of nascent uh, startings of the internet, where this was supposed to be a digital space where we were open to all knowledge that could be freely accessed and, and, and used by all. But of course, we know that's not what has happened. So perhaps we need to um, question first our, our will to transparency more generally, and also how in our particular moment that will is being transformed. One way that I have looked at it comes from anthropologist Marilyn Strathern, who was warned about what she calls the tyranny of transparency, especially in relation to audit cultures. And for this reason, I think it's kind of useful to consider. She's argued that transparency is the promise that everything can be made visible. The problem is that there will always be more realities to uh, uncover, more things to make visible, to make explicit. And what happens by making things visible is we tend to make the implicit go away or not a problem, erasing the implicit through the search for the explicit and making it transparent. Furthermore, she argues, because visibility is presumably about gaining trust in algorithms, in rankings, et cetera, um, in the first instance, it implies there must have been lack of trust to start with, that we need to do this, that we need to make things transparent. But ironically, she argues that in our attempt to make things transparent and to gain that trust, we actually end up potentially undermining that trust. And this is in part due to the fact that expert systems, and I quote, cannot be made fully transparent simply, simply because there is no substitute for the kind of experiential and, and implicit knowledge crucial to expertise and which involves the trust of practitioners." Unquote. Transparency thus undermines the trust that is necessary for expert systems to function and instead, according to her, we get into a language of accountability. So in calls for the openness of algorithms and perhaps their broader computational arrangements, we potentially elide these fundamental questions and perhaps do not address what is at issue. An alternative that Burrow flags is that of the external audit proposed by Sandvig, who uh, um, Mark mentioned. Um, and he has argued that transparency is also a dead end. 
and instead he has advocated what he calls auditability, that is the auditing of outputs and what algorithms do rather than the opening up of a black box as the you know, holy grail that will solve our problems or even auditing code. I think this can be described as attending to the performative effects of what is executed, what is enacted by algorithms and their broader social technical arrangements. Might we then be better position to focus on those effects and ask those kind of ontological questions that we like to in the social sciences about the classifications and subject positions that are enacted, that are made more real, the possibilities that are opened up and closed when data is generated, analyzed, and interpreted. Is this then the site of responsibility, of answerability and accountability of what one does with data and, anal and analytics? What are the consequences of one's own actions? And of course, we would also have to consider that those kind of a performative effects are quite different for those different kinds of algorithms that I outlined and summarized at the beginning. So for example, the effects of social sorting through machine learning algorithms can lead to exclusions and forms of experience discrimination. But let's compare that to platforms that ever more filter and rank the visibility of and access to certain kinds of knowledge or the closing of choices through the narrowing or channeling of what is visible, recommended and accessible, based on assumptions about who we are, what we want, and the resultant challenging of our desires, interests, our opportunities, and our worlds. In respect of these questions, instead of looking to expert solutions such as either code audits or educating subjects, which some people also um, advocate, like teach people code and let them figure it out for themselves, I would like to bring data subjects actively into the center and in relation to the role that they are engaged in, in the very constitution of data and their demands for rights over that data, its generation, its circulation and uses through not only what they say but what they do. Now politically we have a lot of calls for that, that look at data rights as a center or a central um, uh, expression of rights. And we have lots of examples, the charters, we've got legal initiatives, we have even maybe get a EU general data protection regulation one day. But people are exercising and demanding those rights through not only what they say, but also claiming those rights actively through what they do. They're not simply accepting search engine or trending algorithms and their results, but are optimizing, gaming them, ignoring them, contesting or playing with them, doing their own blocking and filtering, and their own encryption of communications, creating multiple identities, deploying bots, and so on. I think through these acts, they are asserting their rights to privacy, anonymity, evasion, or to the data representations about them. In other words, we can think of data as a really complex um, play of uh, diverse subjectivities and power relations between people and things that have varying mixes of their uh, obedience or their submission or even their subversion of them. So if we're looking at algorithms in action, can we also look at human subjects in action and understand that action also better? And I think it's those kinds of power questions that are absent uh, from accounts by Dorish and Burrell of how embodied subjects are acting and in doing so are, the, are part of the making of data and also part of the claim to rights. I think if we ignore this, we risk really naturalizing data as a simple right reading off or representation or reflection of passive subjects and that what is, it, is really at stake is its accuracy. Instead, we can highlight the alternatives that citizen, citizen subjects are performing. So here, I've pointed to two definitions or notions of citizens as active, as both claimants of their data rights, but also as part of the very making of the data that apparently is about them. So how might, for example, new regimes of consent extend beyond mere data collection, anonym, anonymization and privacy, or data sharing with third parties to include consent to the uses, analyses, and applications of that data, including the right to be informed about such uses. Can we really imagine citizen subjects having the right to say yes to anonymized data collection and yes to data sharing, but only consent to research by particular organizations or for particular purposes? Or, as demanded in response to the recent UK healthcare data proposals and their pulling out, a consent opt-in provision rather than an opt-out one. Opting in for data and by default, but um, opting out as not being the default uh, position. And for data which they do give consent for collection and sharing, can, can we imagine this is not being done by those, I uh, like the term shady data brokers um, uh, that you use, but perhaps uh, through the model of blockchain, which was first used as the ledger for Bitcoin and as proposed by Sandy Pentland, 
Through such a model, could we have private data being stored, shared, and analyzed without ever being fully revealed to any party? So I really don't know the answer. These are some suggestions, but I think a good strategy is first to critically think about what our object is, our target, and to think about measures that can support active citizens in exercising their digital and right claims. So a lot of questions, and I know we have just tested and, and pointed to some answers, but I think this is a really worthy debate, and I'm really glad to have joined you here tonight to, to add some comments and, and uh, to join you in discussing this. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Evelyn, and thank you to uh, Frank as well for his lecture. Um, and I think you've both articulated some of the questions that are really at the core of our project um, in um, LSE Data and Society, these questions about um, governance, these questions about citizenship, um, questions about participation, and of course, um, the sort of lively um, experience of being human and being a subject and, and forming a society. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions, um, and then we'll have a reception um, outside. Um, I'm going to collect three questions at a time so we can kind of hear more, more voices from the floor. I've got one here to start. Um, okay, one in the blue in the middle, and black on the end. And they'll be our first group of three questions, and then I'll move on from there. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Veal. I'm a PhD researcher at, between UCL Steep and computer science studying how we can investigate machine learning that makes decisions. Um, now, I think as Evelyn said, algorithms are really interpretable only in a vague sense when they learn from data, even for experts and designers. We can't get these insights out of them. They're also moving very fast. They're learning from situations and creating feedback effects, especially when they make decisions on the same environments they read the data from. Legal systems are going to have to work a lot more with com computer scientists, for example. They're going to have to work a lot more uh, with technical experts in this area and work a lot faster. What kind of role does the law have in governance innovations in this area? Um, and what could they perhaps be at that speed? Okay, great. Question on governance innovations and, um, and collaboration across disciplines. Hi, thank you. Um, I am curious to know um, if the, there can be a bifurcation in which some people that don't like the idea of their privacy being uh, cold or um, gotten around and, and having algorithms do things they don't like, or maybe they just don't like the idea that they can go in a separate direction, like a, a way to take away the consent and still allow people that say, actually, this is a good thing. I'm going to get better deals on my car insurance, better deals on lots of things in life if I reveal my information and allow those people to do that. Can we have two different uh, groups of people at the same time? Okay, so that's a question about um, uh, doing a kind of division between uh, selling data and, um, and uh, valuing data. Is, um, Black, uh, no behind. You had a question, yeah? Hiya, um, I'm Saskia. I graduated from the department a couple of years ago. Um, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on the implications for discriminatory pricing um, based on algorithms uh, for things like income distribution. Great, thank you. Sure. So, um, I'll just, I, I want to take the first and the, uh, and the third, uh, or, or I'll, I'll just uh, initially, is to say that I think with just regard to discriminatory pricing, I think that is an emerging issue of great legal importance, um, especially if you look at the work of Ariel Rahi and Maurice Stuck on algorithms that can sort of collude, or bots, then their behavior can essentially model or eventually result in patterns that are uh, identical to human collusion that had been uh, prescribed under competition law. And I think that essentially what we have to be looking for in terms of these types of price setting algorithms is um, a really close scrutiny by competition and consumer protection regulators to understand them. We also have to, and that's on my wearing my lawyer hat, wearing more of a social theory, th theory hat, and particularly a counter Hayekian social theory hat. Um, we really have to question um, theories like, say, of the market as information processor, um, of, of, as a distributed information processor, when so much data is centralized in very large firms, right? So the whole premise, I think, of a lot of neoliberalism and Hayekian social theory is that you can only have, uh, that the state or centralized, centralized authority can't understand everything that's going on. Well, all of a sudden, we have platforms that kind of do, you know, or, or at least with you know, narrow slices of activity, have such rich and 
incredibly granular data about people's income and their purchasing habits. And that leads to whole new challenges for a political economy that I hope uh, that, again, this, this group uh, of algorithmically accountable scholars, uh, algorithmic accountability scholars can, can rise to that challenge. Um, Okay, yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk, um, well, I'll start with the second one. I think not only a bifurcation, we already have um, many lines of stratification in terms of, of people um, who are more datafied than others, and a lot, we don't have any equality there, that's for sure. And if anything, disadvantaged and marginalized groups are often more targeted, and, and the ones who are perhaps uh, more datafied, if we can use that term, th than others. But I think that uh, that's already happening. Um, different consent rules would certainly potentially add to that. But I like the point you made about consenting to sharing your data, and maybe not only just for individualistic purposes, such as getting access to some services. But I think a lot of us would like to donate our data for scientific purposes and for other very good purposes, especially in the field of health. And I think this is why perhaps the, the blockchain example is, is, is one way of being able to donate your data to this very secure environment where one could uh, entrust not a broker, but you know, a trustworthy organization where that identity and privacy is secured, but would want, let's say, your um, DNA used for research. So I think there are ways uh, that we could, like we donate blood, donate data for particular purposes and not just uh, the particular ones that you, you pointed out. On the first question, um, I don't think our legal systems can keep up. And we had a little conversation about this earlier about uh, perhaps there is a real you know, um, break between our regulatory capacities and their lack of agility and the quick and fast changing not only individual algorithms as you rightly pointed to, but technology. Um, I've been recently in a lot of discussions on the general data protection regulation and just the language of how we speak about technology and that regulation, which we don't know will look, what it will look like next year, is really difficult to do. We have old legal systems um, and regulations that you know, can't keep up and are not fit for purpose. And I think this is one of our challenges of how, how we do that. So I'm looking to, to you, Frank, because <laughs> yeah. how, how we might just define or design better regulatory systems for, for that can be more agile and responsive. Yes, mm -hmm. and I, I will go in two directions on that. One, um, wearing my sort of um, hopeful uh, uh, friend of technology hat and civil society hat, and one uh, and sort of a bad old uh, lawyer model. Uh, and I think that the, in terms of a, I believe that there's a group called OrpenCorporates.gov, which has tried to lend its expertise to financial regulators in order to understand the immense complexity of, say, exotic derivatives, derivatives contracts and intersystemic uh, linkages between, or systemic risk caused by interfirm linkages. And unfortunately, some regulators have refused their help. And I think we need to see new partnerships between civil society institutions and regulators in order to understand the new information environment. Now, wearing my more classical lawyer hat, I found a lot of uh, hope in the aspects of the GDPR uh, or other data protection laws that are talking about much larger fines for companies that violate the law. Because I think that you know, once you talk about a two, three, four percent global turnover fine, then you get uh, the firms to pay attention. So I think a combination of that approach might help. I finally, I have an article from 2010 uh, in the Northwestern Law Review that talks about uh, U.S. Uh, experiments with this civil society agency cooperation. I can uh, post that as well. So, yeah. Okay, great. Another um, group of questions. Um, we have Sonia over there in the middle here with the blue shirt and way at the back on the edge in a blue-green check shirt. <laughs> Color food. I got you. Thank you um, both for a fantastic um, presentation and a uh, uh, a rather cheery presentation of um, really rather depressing um, <laughs> prospects. So, um, so I should have said, Sonia Livingstone from the department here. Um, so I get the sense that the technology is changing very fast, and I get the sense that the citizens can be um, playful or public spirited in trying to subvert. And I see the regulators um, doing their best. I'm surprised not to hear anything more about the big companies, the big corporates who are making the money out of all of this. And I fear that I see that they're kind of somehow sitting in the background. I'd like to bring them into the foreground, and I'd like to 
ask you to focus both on their economic power and also on their global nature and the way in which it's that globality that is really going to escape the, 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 the regulators and the citizens' efforts to um, bring some citizens into the centre of the debate, mm. as Evelyn said. Um, Frank, following, following on your point on the GDPR, I, I wonder, I, I don't know how closely you've been following it, but um, the Data Protection Directive in the mid-90s was talking about uh, transparency of automated decision-making, and I wonder if you think the, GDP, the GDPR, beyond enforceability, as you already mentioned, has any interesting new innovations that take us further forward in the direction that you're calling for. Okay, last question in the middle. Hello, thank you. It goes a little bit uh, with the first question, which is a sense of how sort of the different uh, actors, both the big companies but also these data brokers, how much their interests actually align with the US government and how much sort of power in terms of lobbying mm. do different parts of the corporate world have, so the big companies, data brokers, and perhaps other companies that I'm not aware of. Okay, excellent questions. We've got lots of questions about kind of c corporate governance and also some questions about, about actually the effectiveness of regulation um, over time. Sure. So I think what I would say in response to the first question, I think that is an incredibly important question. And I think that when we think about just how powerful many of these firms are, and I would, I would not just include the finance firms, but also the, the technology firms, but also finance firms and even you know, very large multinationals, I'm reminded of David Rothkopf's book, uh, Power, Inc., where he, he says, you know, in a country like Chad, they might get $10 million of support from the U.S. or the EU each year, but they have $500 million of revenue from Exxon. Who are they listening to? <laughs> and I think we need to have a similar power analysis uh, of the large tech firms because you're right. I mean, there was one story by Dave Dayan recently that talked about literally dozens of papers sponsored by these large firms that are taken as part of the academic community objectively researching them, but are, in fact, paid for by them. <laughs> and that, I think, is very troubling, you know, and I think we have to really look into that deeply. I also think from a legal theory perspective, we all know uh, Henry Sumner Main's uh, idea of moving from uh, status to contract, uh, you know, from feudal to more liberal regimes. I think that uh, when we model, say, the relationship between a user and Facebook as an arm's length contractual relationship governed by terms of service, that's ridiculous. And Margaret Jane Reardon's work on, called Boilerplate has described in great detail exactly how ridiculous that is. What the relationship really is more like is like an administrative agency vis-a-vis -a, -vis a citizen and should be governed by something like administrative law. I think that's the overall legal model. When Facebook changes its terms of service, don't just ask a million people to click yes, have a notice and comment procedure, have uh, challenges before other bodies. I honestly think that would be one way of doing it. Otherwise, the other option is feudalism or neo-feudalism, neo-medievalism, where essentially, you know, we are like serfs on the lord of the manor. That's our, our or was sometimes provocatively called digital sharecropping. Um, I think also in terms of new innovations in the GDPR, um, I'm actually going to Brussels tomorrow to discuss some of these matters and uh, we'll be, you know, talking with folks that are talking about the good and the bad in the document. I do believe that there is a lot to be said for the sort of uh, broad language of the GDPR in terms of trying to vindicate people's rights. And I do believe that uh, something like the right to be forgotten and rights to erasure are really important because they're essentially recognizing what I think ought to be, which is we ought to see a lot of these great data commons or data uh, aggregations in, now in private companies' hands as ideally data commons in some ways. And, and, I, and the health data literature is way ahead of the other data literatures here. You have lots of discussion in health data literature on the commons-like nature of this data, how it should be usable by, say, public authorities, researchers, others, not just, say, hoarded by one private firm. Um, and I think we need to bring that awareness to uh, this field. Finally, in terms of U.S. government lobbying and the power there, I um, have to admit to taking some uh, satisfaction in seeing the safe harbor run aground on the Snowden revelations. <laughs> and I do think that essentially um, we cannot live in a world where people say, I don't care if Google has my data because they can't put me in jail. Well, you know, that's uh, even, you know, setting aside the, uh, I think, rather troubling individualism in such a statement. We have to look further at the fact of how many powerful entities get access to that data. And as, I and, uh, as Daniel Citron and I looked at in our work in fusion centers, how much governmental private sector cooperation there is built into these things. 
You know, if you look at our work on fusion centers, we have an article called Network Accountability for the Domestic Intelligence Apparatus. It's quite striking. And I'm sure the similar things are going on with governments around the world. So we do have to pay attention to this U.S. centrism, absolutely. Um, Evelyn, do you have any comments? I, I, unfortunately, we're quite Okay, late. I'll be really Sorry. quick. <laughs> but that's all right. No worries. Sonia, you know, thanks for the question, because one of the things we haven't talked about, and especially if we're talking about law, is just how much of the activities that were of, of concern transcend borders. And I use the also language of citizens, which also are about their rights for corporations that are not cited in the jurisdictions within which they have their citizenship rights. And we also don't have a capacity of thinking about ourselves as citizens and how we're being perhaps uh, treated and our data is being collected by corporations that are located elsewhere. Our legal systems are really struggling under that and also our imaginaries of our rights are struggling under it. And I think this is one of our great challenges. And then really quickly on the issue of data brokers aligning with government. I think a lot of the digital um, community is aligning with government under the new digital economy initiatives. Where the data and digital is a resource. It's supposed to spur the new economy of the 21st century. And there's a real juxtaposition or mismatch in the current data protection regulation on the one hand coming out of one side of government's mouth and the other side of well, the digital economy and freeing up the free circulation sharing yeah. and digital economy that the corporations are part of. And the latter is really hearing uh, more of the legislature's uh, um, or the legislators or legislators are listening more to that about the digital economy and the need for it than they are I think to the rights of, of citizens. And I think that's really a, the mismatch or the imbalance that we're currently facing. I know there are more questions, but I'm going to have to draw our, the formal portion of our evening to a close and invite you to please ask the other questions that you have of our speakers at the reception that we're holding just outside the theatre um, behind you. Thank you so much for joining us.